Welcome to the Public Affairs Forum at First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. This forum is held most Sundays at noon and is free and open to the public, so please come and join us sometime. For today, I would like to introduce Dale Bula, who will be introducing this morning's speaker. Thank you, Leslie. Richard Kostecki is joining us today. Uh, he earned his BS degree in biology from the University of Kansas, received his MS in zoology from North Dakota State University, and his doctorate he earned in 2002 in the wildlife sciences program at, uh, the, at the Texas Tech University in Lubbock. His first job was as a project scientist with the Nature Conservancy's Fort Hood program, and some of you may know Fort Hood has an amazing bird preservation program. Uh, he also managing endangered species there and their habitats, seeking to find a balance between endangered species and military training, which is a pretty good job, I think. Um, he became the director of the Fort Hood program, and in 2011, he assumed his current statewide role as associate uh, director for conservation here in Texas. Uh, he emphasizes biodiversity and the socioeconomic impacts of nature conservation. He is a Missouri native. To a large extent, his work is not only a vocation, but an avocation. He spends much of his free time traveling, exploring the outdoors, and studying and photographing birds and other of nature's critters. So we'd like to welcome on Earth Day, Richard Kostecki, come and join us. Thank you for that nice introduction, Dale. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here, uh, so close to Earth Day. Uh, a pleasure to be able to talk to you about the Nature Conservancy uh, and our work here in Texas. And uh, we really do have a big state. There's a lot of environmental issues uh, that we deal with. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, to begin with, uh, it's probably helpful for you to know a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish. So our mission statement is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Uh, this is a relatively recent iteration. Uh, previously, uh, we stress more the preservation of biodiversity. Uh, conserve has a little bit of a different connotation. Uh, preservation, uh, you may think of setting something aside, setting nature aside. And we, we know that nowadays, that, that's really impractical. Um, people are part of the equation. We may be part of the problem, but we're going to be part of the solution too. Uh, so if we want nature and natural things, uh, we can't separate ourselves from it. Uh, so conserve has the connotations of wise use or sustainability. Uh, it's also important uh, to recognize that we stress both the lands and waters. The Nature Conservancy started off as a land trust, protecting small chunks of land uh, for rare plants and animals. Uh, we've ramped that up over time, uh, gradually realized that uh, water is an important issue as well. Uh, it has its own set of plants and animals uh, that are worth conserving. Uh, but what happens in the water also has linkages to the land. Uh, in all life, again, that's plants, animals, and it includes us as well. So how do we achieve this mission? Uh, well, we are a global organization, uh, we are the largest, if not the largest, environmental nonprofit out there. Um, we have staff in 35 different countries. Uh, we work in all 50 states, including here in Texas. We are science-based. Uh, so all our strategies uh, have a good, solid foundation uh, in science. Uh, an example of this is our conservation by design framework. Uh, within this framework, we identify conservation values. They could be rare species, endangered species, uh, rare communities, uh, ecosystem function, uh, uh, or some ecosystem service that uh, nature provides us. Uh, we then uh, identify the threats to these values, uh, uh, evaluate their viability, uh, and then using a broad uh, stakeholder base, try to come up with effective solutions to either alleviate threats uh, or improve viability. 
we also tend to partner a lot. Uh, we can't go it alone. We're not going to save the world by ourselves. Everyone needs to be involved. Uh, so we're willing to work uh, pretty much with any, anyone we can find some common ground with. Um, these include individuals. We work with a lot of private landowners in Texas. Uh, obviously, that's important. Uh, Texas is largely a private land state. Uh, over 95% of the land base is held privately. Uh, unlike some of the western states where the bulk of their land is federal. So if we're going to have an impact here in Texas, we have to go out there uh, and talk to these landowners, uh, work with these landowners. Uh, we, we work with both state and federal government, all the different agencies that have some jurisdiction over natural resources or the environment. Uh, certainly other environmental nonprofits, uh, and even non-traditional or seemingly non-traditional partners like corporations uh, or industry groups uh, who, if we can find common ground with them, often have a lot of resources that can be applied to a particular problem. We also tend to be non-confrontational and collaborative. Uh, we're not a radical group. You're not going to see us chaining ourselves to trees, uh, you know, throwing red paint on your fur coats or anything, anything like that. We, we like to think we come up with uh, common sense solutions uh, to real world problems. So what are, are the big global challenges that we face? Uh, and we basically whittle this down into four different uh, boxes here. Uh, the first one is restoring our oceans. Uh, number two is securing fresh water. Third is conserving critical lands. And then fourth is climate change. And climate change sort of works its way through all the other boxes. So sometimes we sort of set it aside, but it could really be uh, intimately intertwined with our work in those other areas. And we do have some uh, overarching global solutions to these problems. Uh, the first is protecting and restoring natural systems. Uh, this is our place-based work. And like I said, we used to focus on small places. We'd go in, uh, buy some land, make it a nature preserve. Uh, but really, there is no untouched place on Earth. Uh, people have had a huge impact on the land, the water, the air, and even the climate. Uh, so these pristine natural places, um, you know, we're not going to save that uh, by just setting things aside anymore. Uh, we have to ramp things up so we have impacts at even greater uh, levels. Uh, so whole systems, systems that include those nice natural areas, but also include working lands and cities. Uh, the second solution is using nature sustainably. Um, this could be sustainable harvest, uh, fisheries, timber, uh, things like that. Uh, it could be uh, impacting uh, governmental policy, legislation, uh, make sure funding goes to conservation programs, um, make sure good practices are in place. The third box is broadening the constituency. And uh, this is the people box. Again, people can't be separate uh, uh, from the nature part here. Uh, again, we are causing some of these problems, but we're also the solution. Uh, and we have to get people involved. One of the things that we like saying is that conservation is not a luxury. Uh, it's a necessity. It impacts everyone's quality of life. It impacts uh, human economies, culture, uh, and these big issues that certainly impact uh, endangered species, imperiled systems, uh, they also have an impact on people as well. And the fourth box is just sort of an interpretive that we have that we hopefully are going about our work in the most effective manner. So what are these conservation challenges? Well, there's certainly conservation action, the policy end of things, uh, especially in this day and age uh, when you know, budgets are a big issue. Uh, environmental programs are often among the first to get cut or reduced. Uh, often these are popular programs, uh, often they're effective programs, and in the big picture they really don't cost that much. Um, climate change, uh, this is not only global warming, you've probably heard a lot about global warming and things are certainly trending hotter and drier, uh, but climate's changing in numerous ways. Uh, we're going to see more erratic weather, uh, more erratic precipitation. Uh, so we're going to have periods of drought like we're in right now. 
uh, it could be punctuated by massive flood events or big bursts of rain that come all at once, which is usually not a good thing. Um, things like hurricanes may get more intense, more erratic. Uh, SLR stands for sea level rise, something we're going to be dealing with, our co with on our coast. Uh, with the warmer climate, sea level uh, may not only be rising, but we're also losing land from subsidence. So the coastline is actually sinking or sloughing off into the ocean as well. Uh, there's just big systems, rainforests, the tropical rainforests, been described as the lungs of our planet, uh, coral reefs, uh, a lot of diversity there, and fishes and other marine animals, migratory birds. Uh, we're in the midst of the spring migration right now. It's a tremendous phenomenon. Uh, but these are complicated issues. These birds, not only they cross state lines, but they cross uh, country lines, uh, cross hemispheric lines. Uh, so really big issues to try to, to get a handle on. Uh, there's always land conservation. Uh, we're continuing to deal with habitat loss and fragmentation from development, uh, incompatible land uses. Uh, and, and there is the, the people issue. Uh, we always joke internally that uh, much of our base, uh, much of our donor base is old, rich, white guys. Uh, and uh, to some extent, that is accurate. Uh, we need, again, to make sure that we're involving everyone, diverse ethnic groups, uh, diverse cultural groups. Uh, again, we need to make sure that people realize that conservation is a necessity, uh, not a luxury. Uh, there's smart development, energy. I mean, we're in a state that's incredible for energy development. Uh, we're in a boom right now uh, with natural gas, oil, wind. Uh, how do you cite these things? in a manner that's environmentally conscious, that, that doesn't impact uh, some of these other resources. Uh, invasive species, uh, you know, it's a global world now. We have species that uh, inadvertently uh, get uh, moved into all sorts of places uh, where they don't uh, normally belong, and they could cause great economic damage uh, as well as ecological damage uh, by outcompeting native species. And we have also a lot of altered just systems out there uh, due to historic land use like overgrazing, fire suppression, uh, freshwater flows. And a lot of these issues that are kind of on the global stage, we're finding them all playing out here in Texas. So these are all things that we deal with here in the state. A little history about the state chapter. We started in 1964, which is about 10 years after uh, the national organization started, so we've had a fairly long tenure here. Uh, we currently have about 90 employees, and they're spread out uh, over a variety of functions. We have conservation, our land stewards, our preserve managers, our fire crews. Uh, we have our operations folks, uh, office managers, the accountants, uh, government relations. Uh, we have people uh, whose businesses to follow the legislation, to lobby. Uh, marketing. Uh, you might not think of that uh, as a main functional area, but if we want to reach those new diverse audiences, uh, we're going to need folks with that skill set. Uh, certainly philanthropy. We need to raise money since we're a nonprofit. Uh, sci and then the group I'm part of, the science. Uh, how do you identify priorities? How do you monitor? How do you evaluate whether your strategies are being effective? So we have 21 offices throughout the state. We're present in most areas of the state, not all of the areas, but most. Uh, and this number is a little old, but we have about 30,000 members uh, uh, within the state. It's probably a bit more than that now. So those are folks like you. So what's so special about Texas? You know, why is the Nature Conservancy in Texas? Why do we have such a big presence? And well, big, diverse state. Uh, we're the second largest state in terms of land area, uh, second in population. Uh, that population number, 26 million, is projected to double in the next 50, 60 years. Uh, one of the blessings of having a booming economy, people want to come here. Um, that's assuming we'll reach that population goal if our natural resources hold out. And right now, things like fresh water are not projected to hold out. Uh, incredibly diverse to state. You can see on the map there, uh, it goes
goes from the west Texas, which is the brown, the arid land, uh, to the east Texas, where it's greener. So we have uh, incredible differences in climate. Uh, elevation, we go from sea level to nearly 9,000 feet in west Texas. All of this creates a lot of different habitats, a lot of different niches, uh, so it gives us a lot of different species. Um, Texas has three of the ten largest cities. Like I said, we're in a boom time right here. Um, Houston's number four. San Antonio is number seven. Dallas is nine. Austin's the 13th largest city in the U.S. Uh, Fort Worth, 16. El Paso, 19. Uh, if you look at population growth in the state, except for a few little cities out here in West Texas and up in the Panhandle, Across the board, Texas is gaining population. And most of our current population is in those big cities, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio. Despite all that, uh, again, Texas is one of the most biodiverse states that we have. You can see it, the, the darker blue, purple states are the ones with the more biodiversity, so greater than 4,500 species in the state. Uh, how does that rank out? Uh, well, we're in the top five for pretty much everything. Plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, the only thing we don't rank on is the fishes. Maybe if you, I'm not sure they included the Gulf of Mexico in that. Uh, if you include the Gulf of Mexico, we'd probably be up there with, for the fish. So I had mentioned kind of our global challenges, and that is reflected here in Texas in our programs. Uh, we have a marine program, fresh water, and our land programs split out uh, among grasslands, forests, and arid lands. Arid lands being uh, our deserts, our West Texas mountains, uh, southern high plains of the Panhandle. So I'm going to start off with the Gulf of Mexico. This is an area we've been putting a lot of effort into, not only within the state, but on a national level. Uh, certainly, it got a lot of attention after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, which was a huge impact. Uh, but we, sometimes we forget that was only the most recent impact. The Gulf of Mexico has been abused for a long time. There's a lot of issues, and it hasn't received the attention uh, that other large bodies of water have. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, uh, but for as important to the U.S. as the Gulf of Mexico is, uh, it really hasn't received as much uh, attention. Uh, it, it's actually a significant feature for the state. We have 377 miles of coastline. Uh, the Gulf is also biologically diverse. It's one of the most biologically diverse bodies of water in the world. Uh, and it's not just the flat expanse of open water like you see there. Uh, there's coral reefs, particularly in the southern Gulf. Uh, oyster beds, uh, oysters, have, you know, the oysters, and I have a slide on this, so we'll talk a little bit more, but oysters have taken a tremendous hit. Uh, Seagrass, uh, and then our coastal wetlands and dune systems. And, and the Gulf is, you know, not just because of biodiversity, but for people, it's incredibly important. Uh, the economic benefits of tourism, commercial and recreational fisheries, energy development. We have oil and gas out there. We have wind out there. Uh, there's just a lot going on. Uh, and just some numbers to support that. The Gulf uh, contributes $234 billion a year to the U.S. economy. Uh, it supports 20 million jobs, uh, 1.3 billion pounds of seafood a year, with an estimated value of 661 million. The Gulf is the main seafood producer for the U.S. Uh, it produces more than half of the nation's domestic oil and gas, uh, and 13 of the nation's largest ports are located in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so there's a lot going on out there, and a lot of it is really reliant upon the natural resources out there. And as I suggested, the Gulf's been kind of used and abused for a long, long time. Uh, I'll give a specific example here, but some of you have may have heard of the hypoxic zone uh, at the mouth of the Mississippi. It's basically a dead area where there's no oxygen in the water. It can't support life. And that's because of all uh, the nutrients and chemicals and stuff coming down from the 
the farming regions uh, of the central U.S. Uh, Louisiana loses a football field of land, I think, per hour uh, there. So uh, it's getting whittled away. Uh, an example in Texas, uh, we lucked out at least on the oil spill. It didn't have a lot of direct uh, impact to us. Uh, but we have a lot of other issues. And one of them is freshwater inflows into the Gulf. We have all these rivers that enter the Gulf, uh, flow into our bays and estuaries. Uh, and that freshwater input is critical. Uh, a recent case you may have heard of is the whooping cranes. Uh, basically, uh, a lawsuit uh, went through and it basically said that the water authority, uh, yeah, was at fault, that they needed to provide water and could provide water uh, for this endangered species. Um, and uh, a lot of the problem was there was years where there was big mortality for the cranes because the freshwater inflows weren't reaching the Gulf. Uh, so the salinity in the bays and estuary this would spike. And that's not good for things like blue crabs, for wolf berries, all these key food plants for these animals. Just the impacts to the cranes. Uh, you have other groups that are upset about the freshwater inflows because a lot of those areas, those bays and estuaries, are key spawning grounds and nurseries for a lot of economically important fish. This map, it just basically, uh, it's hard to see there, but basically grades the health of our bays and estuaries. Uh, we have a few of them that are in good condition. Uh, most of them are in the red, the danger zone, in terms of uh, having the fresh water inflows that they need to maintain natural processes. Um, and again, this table's hard to see, but it basically summarizes data on under natural conditions, typical year, how much freshwater inflow uh, units are there? Uh, so for Sabine Lake, that's, let's say, two units of water. The demand on it, the projected demand is 10 units. How are you going to squeeze out more water from a river that's already overtaxed? Again, we have a lot of priority sites across the Gulf. Uh, and one of the big things we're pushing uh, especially when we, we may see start seeing some of the fine money from the uh, deep water horizon. Uh, we've done a lot of government relations, making trying to make sure that the money actually goes back to ecological restoration for, from things like the Restore Act, our NERDA, Natural Resource Damage Assessment. Uh, we've seen some settlements occur that have already sent some fine money to the state uh, to do conservation. Uh, this may be to protect coastal lands, could be to build oyster reefs. Um, hopefully by the end of the year, maybe this fall, we'll start seeing some of, the, some of that money, more of it, start flowing into the Gulf regions. I said I'd talk more about oysters, and this is um, a really important coastal issue, uh, and we're very involved in oyster restoration. Uh, the Gulf oyster fishery is actually in Know, comparatively good shape compared to the East Coast oyster fishery, which is not saying much when you only have 1% to 7% of the oysters remaining in each of your bay systems. Um, so we're, we're big into trying to restore these oyster reefs, recreate them. And they have a lot of values. Uh, one, they're incredibly biodiverse. Uh, you have a lot of other fish and animals using them. They're nursery areas for uh, fish, shrimp, uh, other things. Um, also, the way we recreate these reefs in a natural fashion, uh, a, lot of these re a lot of the reefs out there right now are flat because that's easy to harvest. Naturally, they would have three-dimensional structure. There have been towers. And those towers actually form barriers. So they reduce the energy of storm surge coming in. So if you have a hurricane or something, if you have something that's blocking that storm surge reducing the energy, uh, the damage is going to be a lot less. So this is what we talk about when we mention natural infrastructure. Uh, rather than engineer a solution, uh, we have natural solutions out there that could help us. This is some, sh these are little baskets with oysters and we're using this as for shoreline protection. 
that are Mad Island Marsh Preserve uh, in Matagorda County. That's the intercoastal waterway, so you have barges going up and down that constantly. And that wave action that they create actually starts eroding the shoreline. Uh, so we put those in place to help reduce again, that energy from the wave action and hopefully keep our shoreline. I had mentioned natural infrastructure. Oyster reefs can provide it. Um, coastal wetlands are also a natural infrastructure. Uh, this is a picture of the Dow plant in Freeport. We actually had a, had a collaboration with them recently. Uh, and one of the things that we were looking at is natural infrastructure, the value of these coastal salt marshes and wetlands uh, as protection against uh, hurricanes. And uh, they actually do have value in that. Uh, one of the things that we actually came out of this collaboration, it may not have impacted their plans immediately in, in terms of placing gray infrastructure versus green infrastructure. Uh, but we made some of the engineers down there aware that this right here is not the same as imper the impervious cover they've been treating it as. It's different than a parking lot. It has different values and it deals with storm surge uh, a, a lot differently. So that was one of the wins there. We've actually uh, provided information to some of these engineering firms where they could actually treat it in their planning and their models and stuff as something better than impervious cover. Uh, so hopefully that gives them some more options in the future. It might mean they, they don't need as much gray infrastructure. They could build the dikes lower if they have wetlands around it which means lower cost. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but this is sea level rise. As, as climate changes, uh, sea level is projected to rise roughly three feet in places along the coast. Uh, so you, you have the dark blue. This is a barrier island here. Uh, the dark blue or purple is uh, the gulf. And as you see, uh, you start to have sea level rise come up. Uh, it's going to whittle away a lot of that land base. And again, you know, there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of human infrastructure in that area, a lot of industry. So this is going to have severe impact. Uh, freshwater, uh, huge issue in Texas. Uh, it's been one of the big focuses of the legislature this session. Uh, and as our state director likes to say, it's a fixed asset. We're not creating new water. We can't create new water. We can recycle it. We can serve it. Uh, but we're stuck with what we have. Uh, uh, so some of the issues with freshwater, we do still a lot of biodiversity work. There's a lot of rare uh, endangered uh, plants and animals in these aquatic systems. Uh, you may have heard about the salamanders uh, around here. But there's rare fish as well in places. Uh, we've done a lot of freshwater priority mapping. Not only where is the biodiversity, uh, but where can it be protected? Where can it be restored? Where can we make wise investments? Uh, basically, uh, something to help us uh, pick our battles. In the water world, policy is a key issue. Uh, water law, if you've uh, gotten into it, in Texas and other western states can be very, very interesting. Uh, not necessarily in good ways, in my opinion. Uh, but one of our big things that we've been pushing with the legislature is to actually fund the state water plan. We do have a water plan. That's a good thing. Uh, but we never you know, allocated any money to fund it. Uh, and the water plan even has, they even went to uh, the extent of uh, doing an analysis to say, what happens if we don't fund the water plan? And the cost is tremendous. Uh, so there's been a big push uh, on trying to get that done this legislative session. Uh, we're also trying to make an impact there that there's all kinds of things that they put in the water plan. Uh, we want to make sure it goes to good projects, projects that are going to uh, kind of the low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of water conservation measures that can be implemented, uh, like improving irrigation. Um, pipes, newer technologies and stuff that could be put into place that would save a lot of water, it would make a significant impact, and they're uh, relatively low-hanging fruit, things that could be done if there's just some impetus. Uh, a lot easier than going out and building new reservoirs or uh, things like that. 
we have several river or watershed projects throughout the state. This is where we work with private landowners, uh, often on bank side project protection. I have a slide that will talk a little bit about water funds, but uh, this is where we use public funding uh, to implement uh, water protection or water conservation. And we have some really good examples of that here in Austin uh, in San Antonio. Uh, the energy water nexus, uh, one of the things the state doesn't have, we have a water plan, but we don't have an energy plan for the state. Uh, our energy supply is heavily dependent on water availability, which we know is a limited resource. Um, we got a little rain recently, but most many reservoirs in the state are on track to set record lows for you know, pool fill. Uh, and we're already seeing them cut off water you know, downstream for uh, certain ag uses and uh, things like that. Uh, another idea we've uh, actually thrown out from the case like the whooping crane is maybe an organization like the Nature Conservancy could come in and actually buy water rights from people. We'd hold them, not use them, uh, uh, and then that way people are compensated uh, but then the water stays in the river, flows downstream. Uh, we still have those, those flows uh, that help species like the whooping cranes. So this is our San Antonio Water Aquifer Protection Plan. And we've been really successful at putting up bond issues, helping support those bond issues, and getting the uh, citizens of San Antonio to actually vote to fund those bond, vote for those bond issues so that funding can then be uh, put into protecting aquifer recharge land. And, and this is the recharge zone, right? Going through there. And we're starting to piece together a lot of surface protection. Uh, the recharge zone, that's where the water is going into the aquifer. Uh, and San Antonio is pretty much 100% reliant on the aquifer for their, their water supply, for their drinking water. So uh, having good quality water get into the aquifer is of some importance. Austin, we're a little different. We do get some uh, water supply from the aquifer, but we also get a lot of surface water from like the Colorado River. Uh, this program's also been good too because uh, that's surface protection, and a lot of that ends up being also in places that have endangered species habitat, golden cheek warblers, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of bang for your buck program like this. This is at our Cibolo Creek Preserve, which is out there uh, a little bit south of New Braunfels, between New Braunfels and San Antonio. And this is Cibolo Creek. It's dry, but that's a recharge zone. It's dry because the water is going underground right there. Another issue that we're beginning to try to wrap our heads around is groundwater. Uh, this is a picture of the Devil's River out in West Texas. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, this is uh, really the last free-flowing river in Texas. Um, this the water, state water quality standard is set by this river. This is the cleanest river in Texas, uh, but it's under threat from groundwater pumping. Uh, you have a lot of different cities throughout Texas that are eyeing this area for future water supply. Who knows what that's going to mean uh, for this river. In terms of some of our more traditional land work, um, again, it's hard to see the colors here. Uh, this map, through our conservation planning, uh, we have all these different green blobs. So those are areas that we have identified of some conservation importance. There's rare species there. There's intact systems. Uh, so that helps guide our work. Um, and there's certainly a lot of challenges out there on the land. I already talked about development, um, habitat loss, fragmentation, uh, land use. Um, this right here is a picture of the border fence. It actually goes, splits our southmost preserve uh, down in Brownsville in two. Most of our preserve is actually south of the fence. Uh, Tremendous barrier to a lot of wildlife. So it's a major issue. I found this picture really interesting. So it's a picture of Texas 
a recent picture of Texas at night. And obviously, you have uh, the big cities. So you have San Antonio, Austin, Houston, uh, Dallas. Then you have this big band right here. This is new. That's all the lights from the Eagle Ford shale play. So tremendous rapid impact. I mean, it's producing enough light pollution on the level of some of the cities there, not to mention other impacts. Uh, but you also, you know, just think of that, but you also have other uh, energy plays, you know, uh, the Barnett Shale off by Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, uh, the Panhandle. So one of our traditional ways of of conserving land was just to buy it outright and protect it. And uh, we do that in several different ways. We actually own preserves in fee. Uh, one of the things we do differently compared to some of the other groups is we actually pay taxes on all our properties. We don't have to, but we do. Um, we do conservation easements. Uh, these are when we essentially buy the development rights, uh, maybe rights to subdivide or we get those rights donated to us. Uh, I talked about the San Antonio uh, and Austin bond issues, uh, the securing public funding uh, to get conservation done. It could be land conservation, it could be water conservation. Uh, and then we've also acquired a lot of land where we hold it for a while and then we pass it on to the state or the federal government. So we have preserves across, th across the state uh, we have about 100,000 acres of preserved land in Texas. Uh, some of them are open to the public or they have uh, open days that the public can visit. Um, Nature Conservancy in general is the lar has the largest private preserve system in the world. In terms of our easements, uh, we work with over 100 private landowners across the states to uh, protect uh, their land. Again, often it's to protect it from subdivision. Uh, a very common issue is uh, they don't want their heirs to break up the ranch into smaller pieces. They want to maintain it as a whole. Uh, so by donating the easement to us, uh, having us hold those rights, uh, they can make sure that the ranch stays intact. Uh, we protect another uh, you know, 284,000 acres through agreements like that. Uh, and this is actually one of our conservation buyer properties out on the Devil's River, uh, you know, a small ranch of only 40,000 acres. Uh, and this is one that we didn't want to hold this as a preserve ourselves, but we found a conservation buyer who had purchased the property with easements on place uh, already. So if it's something that's critical but we don't want to hold on to it as a preserve, uh, we'll, we'll do, go that route as well. And one of our big hopes is when we do all this land protection, whether it be with our preserves, whether it be with our easements, uh, this is our Love Creek Preserve in Bandera County. These red areas are conservation easements. And again, hard to see here, but that's Lost Maple State Natural Area. So our goal here would be to create a connected landscape of protected lands. Uh, you know, one preserve, one park, one easement off by itself may not accomplish a lot. But if you could start piecing those together into a larger whole, uh, you start to have some uh, resilience, uh, uh, some adaptability uh, capacity. Again, I talked about the, the public funding. This is sort of our history of public funding uh, from Austin down to San Antonio. Uh, so uh, since 1992, uh, We've helped secure uh, $768.5 million in public funding to help protect things like the aquifer uh, and to buy park lands, that sort of thing. And I had talked about uh, transferring land to other entities, uh, which is a, a big, uh, one of our big strategies. Uh, and out of all the public land in Texas, and there is some, uh, certainly, uh, We've actually helped transfer 369,000 acres to different you know, state parks, national wildlife refuges. And if you look through the list, and I think this is just a partial list, if you name a piece of public land in Texas, 
uh, there's a good chance the Nature Conservancy either had some role in creating it or adding to it. Uh, some examples include it, that we've added pieces to Big Bend National Park. Uh, Enchanted Rock State Natural Area, fairly iconic. We used to own that. We transferred it to the state. Um, many, many national wildlife refuges we've added to. Uh, in town, Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we've helped uh, contribute to that. Uh, it's not just sufficient to go out and buy land or buy an easement. Uh, one of the obligations you do have uh, is on the stewardship end of things. Uh, you have to manage, manage it, potentially restore it, uh, monitor your actions. And so we do a lot of that. This is one of our restoration projects, Shamrock Island out in Corpus Christi Bay, a uh, tremendously important colonial water bird nesting island. Uh, and we just got some funding, uh, went through a real brutal review process with the Army Corps of Engineers and stuff to actually add to this island and to build it up uh, to get it back uh, into the shape and the stature it historically was in uh, before a lot of it's eroded away. Climate change, it sort of intertwines with a lot of our work. Uh, you have to kind of take it into consideration. Um, you know, with rainfall being more erratic, you know, this is something uh, we may not see as much of. Blue bonnets are really dependent on good fall rainfall. We didn't have good fall rainfall last year. Um, just one of the, you know, maybe we don't think about things like that, but that's some of the impacts we'll begin to see. The wildfires, 2011 was a historic uh, wildfire year in Texas. It was our historic one-year drought, too. Uh, things are projected to be hotter and drier. The fire weather is projected to be more intense. Um, you know, so we may be seeing more of this. Uh, people that are in this field, uh, they talk about, you know, as scary as it sounds, this sort of event could be the new norm. That's just a before and after picture. So that gives you sort of an introduction to uh, the Nature Conservancy in Texas, some of the issues we're involved with and how we go about addressing them. Uh, I didn't go take any deep dive into a lot of the details, but uh, if you want details on anything, you can certainly uh, ask me during the Q&A session. And uh, there's a few ways you could potentially help. Uh, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you as a member. Uh, I think you could become a free e-member. Uh, just go to our website. Uh, certainly donating is good. Uh, follow us and like us on Facebook. We're generally likable people. So um, follow us on Twitter. Again, that's part of our new effort to outreach and get new audiences, more diverse audiences. You have to meet the people where they're at, and that's where a lot of the people are at nowadays. Uh, we do have some volunteer opportunities occasionally on our preserves. Uh, we do have open days, like I said, on some of our preserves, so I encourage you to take advantage of it. We, we protect some really precious and incredibly beautiful places in the state. Um, you know, when, when uh, issues come up for vote, you know, you vote, you know, not only at the ballot box, but also with your money and stuff. So uh, certainly vote for environmental friendly legislation. Uh, but, you know, use your parks, uh, support them, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it does make a difference. And enjoy. It's an incredible world out there, full of beauty and wonder. And uh, we do have some challenges. We can address these challenges, but uh, we also must not forget to enjoy what's out there. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And uh, we'll take questions now from the audience. Um, Dale? <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, in our society, money seems to make a lot of determination as what's important. And I think many times we don't actually put a dollar value on preservation. Uh, we can put a dollar value on a water treatment plant, but several hundred acres of land that do the same kind of job of treating and protecting our water, 
has uh, virtually no value. And um, what kinds of things has the Nature Conservancy done to try to focus the importance of um, valuing this thing with a dollar amount which people can identify with? Well, it's something we've thought about a fair bit. And certainly there's a big, uh, you know, a lot of discussion around, you know, what is the value of nature? What is the value of green infrastructure? So what would it cost to, let's say, make an Ike dike to protect Houston versus some, you know, keeping your wetlands there? Uh, many times the green infrastructure is more cost effective and it has other benefits uh, to nature and society as well. Uh, but it's one we struggle with because there's, uh, some ecosystem services, uh, some benefits of nature that we get that are just hard to put a monetary figure on. Uh, you know, clean air. Uh, it's hard to know how much, you know, um, some volume of clean air. You know, what is the price of that? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, there's new, new studies coming out. There, there's a study that was interesting that uh, is from an urban area, but urban areas with more trees tend to have, like, I think it was people uh, healthier, less heart attacks, uh, something like that. So there's, it's, there's people are really starting to look at this angle now. There's some interesting uh, things that are starting to emerge, and we may start to put more value on some of these things, not just as a, some vague, abstract quality of life issue, but as something that has direct impact uh, to our health, happiness, and economies. Um, and it's interesting on some stuff because uh, it kind of goes both ways. We're trying to put value on nature because that's, you know, what the economists, that's what the politicians, uh, folks like that in power seem to understand. Uh, but you sometimes take that to the, the general public and they're like, oh, no, we can, you know, it kind of turns them off. It's a very cold way of approaching it. Uh, so it works for some audiences. Uh, but some things, you know, that awe of nature and all that, it's just people don't want to put a value on it. They think it should be above that. So I don't know how you balance those two approaches uh, in this day and age, but there's a lot of activity in that realm. Yes, I found your suggestion of buying water rights so the water stays in the river and goes down to the whooping crane, very novel and innovative, but given the fact that our rivers are already overcommitted. How can you be sure there'll be any water left after everybody else takes what they're legally entitled to since the whooping crane is the last one in the chain? Yes, that's, well, you have to buy the right water rights, the senior water rights. Um, and uh, that's why we're, we haven't implemented yet and just explored it because that gets really complicated. Uh, if you don't know how water rights work, there's uh, you know, often a lot of these basins are over-allocated. There's more demand uh, than water in the river. And that's always. Um, but there are some, some rights holders. Uh, the older, they tend to be, you know, the ones that have been there the first, uh, you know, been around the longest. They tend to get first priority, and then there's kind of the junior water rights that, you know, they're going to be the first ones bumped if there's a water shortage. Uh, so if we did go about that, we'd have to make sure that we're getting the correct uh, water rights. Uh, some of it, other approaches sort of tied to that would be for some of these uh, senior water rights, if they're industry, you know, is there ways, you know, uh, that they can develop where they wouldn't have to use those water rights as much. Uh, so, uh, like, one of the things we are talking about is, like, right now, fracking uses a lot of fresh water. I think they're getting to a point with the technology where they could start using brackish water. Currently, we don't know. We have sort of a surplus of brackish, salty water uh, that we don't know what to do with, uh, not good for drinking or you know, other purposes. But if this technology is developed and we could kind of shift them to lower quality of water and things like that, we may be able, there might be a lot of moving parts there to make stuff like that uh, work. I don't think it's going to be easy because I, I, I still don't see anyone giving up their water rights at the moment. But it, it's one option that really hasn't been tried in the past, and uh, we'll, we'll see if it has any uh, legs under it. If you do have a question, raise your hand, and we'll come around to you eventually. Hi, my name is...
is Felicia. I want to thank you for a birding expedition. I was lucky enough to get to ride in your Jeep at Fort Hood a couple years ago with That's Travis right. Audubon. Um, today, the Green Sanctuary Committee put on a little event focusing on the border wall and the effect on wildlife. And in researching that, I skimmed, and skimming for me is always kind of dangerous. And I thought I remembered something about the preserve in Brownsville perhaps being closed because they wanted to close the wall. But if you could talk about that, and hopefully that's wrong, and any other lands you might have along the border and just general sure. effects. Uh, our southmost preserve is interesting. Uh, the uh, wall does split off uh, most of the preserve. Uh, so most of the preserve is south of the wall. Uh, I think we have one little ag field uh, that is north of the wall, which doesn't have high conservation value, and it's only a small chunk. Uh, so all the good stuff is behind the wall. Um, right now, there's no gate. So there's a big gap in the wall. And we don't know when th that gate will happen, if it will happen. Uh, you know, normally, there's border patrol sitting there watching, that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, if they keep it as is, we may still be able to, you know, uh, work that land. Um, if there's a gate, you know, supposedly we'll have a key to the gate or some way to get through. In theory, in practice, we'll see what actually happens. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a big issue, and so we deal with that all the time. Is it still feasible to operate down there? Um, is it still, you know, safe for our people uh, to be uh, in that situation? And, uh, you know, so it's something we struggle with. At the moment, the preserve's still there. Uh, there hasn't been, uh, there, there's been some impacts. The way they set up the fence, I think, actually changed the way some of the water flowed onto the preserve. So we used to get a lot of runoff from some of the farming operations that would flow into our Osakas. So we haven't been getting that, so that's been sort of a big impact. Um, so, uh, you know, things aren't perfect, uh, but we still have the sable palm forest down there. And, uh, you know, even in the face of the wall, we had our guys out there taking out big sable palms and moving them and replanting them in areas, uh, you know, to make sure the wall didn't take them out. Um, so... So we'll see. I mean, certainly there is a wildlife impact. Uh, they know that. Things like birds might not be an issue, really small things, uh, insects, frogs. Uh, there's a classic picture of a turtle trying to squeeze through the fence. It's kind of sad. I'm not really, I think it maybe eventually managed it, but it, it was a struggle. Uh, certainly critical wildlife that uh, we're interested in, uh, like ocelots, uh, things like that. The wall is horrible for them. They can't deal with it. Uh, so big impacts uh, there. So at the moment, it's, you know, in some ways, it's a wait and see. Uh, we're, we're kind of day by day, we're evaluating whether this is feasible uh, or not. And it'd be a shame if we can't make it work some ways, because that's, for the U.S., that is really a unique system uh, down there along the Rio Grande. Um, we do have some other preserves, but they're north the wall. They're smaller uh, and take less intensive management. Uh, they're mostly for protection of rare cactus. Uh, so we haven't had as many issues uh, issues there. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We just have time maybe for one more question. Up ahead. Um, I remember um, your predecessor, or An Andrew uh, Sampson, or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, was into hunting and fishing, and I'm not very much in favor of either one of those for sport. And I was just wondering, when you acquire a land, uh, an area, um, do the landowners sometimes uh, insist on conditions of allowing that type of sport? Uh, when you turn the land over to, say, the state, uh, do you do similar types of things? So uh, many traditional land uses we continue to allow. Uh, so certainly like hunting and 
fishing, uh, grazing, uh, things like that. Uh, often there's language uh, like, you know, if you're going to do deer hunting, you have to have a deer management plan in place for your property. Um, you know, so we like them to think about it, uh, think about the resource, uh, and, you know, not just uh, make it a trophy hunting operation or something like that. Uh, but we do allow those what we consider to be traditional land uses. Uh, when we transfer land, it really depends on who we're transferring it to. Uh, if it's the Park Service, they don't allow park hunting on parks, National Park Service land. Uh, so if, it, if land we held went there, then it wouldn't be hunted. Uh, if it became a state park, uh, likely uh, most of the state parks aren't hunted. But if it became a wildlife management area, uh, it may be hunted. Um, but you know, most landowners, um, you know, traditional uses, things like for cattle, we want to make sure they have a good, you know, been thinking about a grazing plan and that they're not going to overgraze it and impact the resource. Uh, but you know, for them, you know, many of them, you know, many folks, they end up going with the uh, cattle for the ag exemption, the, the uh, tax exemption there. Uh, many of them would just soon like to get that tax exemption through the wildlife uh, part of it. Uh, so it really just depends on the interest of the landowners uh, that we have. And as long as it's not uh, in conflict with you know, the conservation values that we've identified for that piece of property, uh, then we'll allow them to continue. I think that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Richard Kostecki from the Nature Conservancy. It's been a really interesting presentation. And thanks, everybody, for coming today. Thank you. And for some of the other you, of you who had questions, I'll, you know, I could handle them here afterwards if you still have them. <laughs>